Consumed is the first novel from acclaimed Canadian filmmaker David Cronenberg. It's a visceral modern mystery, running riot with mad scientists, strange diseases, erotic philosophers, simulated cannibalism, and sleek, fetishistic technologies. Like Cronenberg's films, it seduces you into a dark place filled with hidden mirrors and challenges you to meet the gaze of your own obsessive reflection. Please join us for an elegant autopsy on the consumed edition of Book Circle Online. From the Library of Maria Menounos, this is Book Circle Online, featuring in-depth discussion, insight, news, and commentary on all the world's leading book titles and their authors. And now, Book Circle Online. Welcome back to Book Circle Online. I am Jason Squamata. I am here with my ravishing and brilliant co-hosts. Christy Lovato. Pat Janowski. And Mark Savage. And uh, this week we are discussing Consumed, the first novel by acclaimed filmmaker David Cronenberg, uh, director of uh, such um, mind-meddling, uh, muddling masterpieces as uh, Videodrome Existence. The Fly, Dead Ringers, that sort of thing. Um, but uh, this is his first novel, and uh, uh, I think he's uh, he's always uh, he's always been a favorite of mine. And he's a he's a very literary filmmaker, and has uh, had an interesting relationship with adaptation and using other people's novels in his work, um, which we will talk about further. But uh, this is his first book, and uh, what thoughts have we on consumed, Christy? Um, I I really enjoyed this book. I I felt like you could, you could sense his talent as a filmmaker in the book. Every every scene was so richly described, and every sort of set was was so detailed that I really enjoyed it. It was not what I expected, which I imagine we'll get into in time. <laughs> um, but yeah, I really I liked it. Excellent, Pat. I can't imagine what you expected. I uh, I expected something shocking and disgusting and. Um, captivating, which this was. Hmm. Um, you know, the description, the cinematic um, nature of this book, at, at first, maybe the first five to ten pages, though, that was it. I was really conscious of his description. You know, she stepped out onto the small square boundary. Da, 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 da. Everything was so richly described. It felt like, oh, come on, stop, you know, pleasuring yourself, Cronenberg. But it, that all fell away. And I, I realized this just as you were saying that earlier, Christy, because, it, yeah, that it's, it was grating just for a second, mm. but then it really worked for me. Um, I, I do have to note that he is so much in love with his technology. Mm. I found that to be quite intrusive, especially up the first two-thirds of the book. There was every paragraph, there was a new, new brand name of something, right. which I know is part of the point of the thing, but. Right. Gotcha. Excellent. Mark? I, I'd like to think if I hadn't known this was a Cronenberg novel and you told me this was written by a famous film director that I would have been able to piece together and known that it was Cronenberg because it seems to hit on so many themes that he hits again and again. Yeah. There are insects and there is surgery and there's technology and they all kind of mix together. Yes. Um, completely meshed together. Um, I, yeah, I really enjoyed it. You couldn't put together the pieces as it were sorry oh. spoiler alert oh uh yes there are body parts in the book mm. or are there um or are there mm. good question which brings us around let's let's talk about the technology aspect um because i uh um yet yeah, i mean obviously it's part of the theme of the book this uh nathan are you going to give a little overview um of your impression oh yeah okay well my yes i'm interested to hear that's why um I uh I'm a I'm a huge fan of his as a filmmaker. I was excited to read this. Um and uh I guess I had different expectations too, um, like Christy. Um and I'm not sure what they were because I was uh as much as he plays upon his customary obsessions and themes, I was um shocked and delighted by the humor of this book. I yeah, thought this yeah. book was hilarious. Me too. Mm -hmm. And it's it's this special kind of like Comedy, I hesitate to even, but this humor of an extremely intelligent man who is, who is uh, very kind of compulsive and obsessive in the images that, you know, that 
attract him and that he finds resonant, but uh, but is also a sort of urbane man of the world. Mm -hmm. You know, you really get that feeling, and uh, and in that in that sense. Um, you know, people are comparing this to Nabokov and, you know, and, mm. I, and I can, I can see that in, uh, I think it's yeah. almost a satire of his previous obsessions uh -huh. with the fetish, like the fetishization and the, like people being drawn into others, fetishes right, right, and, right, right. and obsessions. Yeah. Well, it, but it is, it has this, this, it, this weird balance where you can read it as a parody, but it, it is actually creepy. I mean, uh -huh. at least I found it so it is you know, emotionally affecting. And, uh, but um, I love the way he paints relationships. Me too. Yeah. In, in what feels like this, like just, uh, you know, sort of forensic modern way. And, uh, and I can, and I, I know, you know, he's openly espoused, you know, the, the Burroughs influence and, you know, he's worked mm -hmm. with Burroughs material and the Nabokov influence, but uh, the, the Ballard influence, I feel like he, his literary imagination has been basted in J.G. Ballard because it's the same and you can, you know, see it in his film of Crash, but this, uh, this sort of, um, yeah, a, a, a relationship between very sexual people, um, you know, sort of like post-moral people, career people who are connected by technology, immersed in technology. Naomi and, and Nathan. Yeah. Well, Nathan. also the, the <clears throat> our, our, please pronounce that for me. You did it earlier. Arosta guy? Arosta guys as well. Yes. Because yes. they're based on consumerism as they are. Yes, indeed. Yeah. <laughs> and the <laughs> way, I mean, I, I, I feel like. You but know. yeah, th th that it was, uh, they have these relationships. They're connected by technology, but that's only one tiny aspect of it. They're connected. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, well, it, yeah. you know, and at times, and when they speak, um, uh, Naomi and Nathan, Nathan Math and Naomi Seberg, I love the names of these characters yeah. <laughs> so yeah. much. And, uh, and the way that they're, that when they speak of having a kind of, you know, telepathic link or a muted telepathic link or the way that their stories kind of mirror each other and we're seeing these separate narratives and these separate histories they're pursuing and unearthing, snaking around each other and feeding each other in such a delicate and creepy way. Tightly wound. Yeah, yeah. And, um, but it feels like, you know, that, that they have like principally a media relationship. You know, most of the time they spend together is through all these abstractions and mediations. And it's almost, it's not like they're so connected that that's why they have such an affinity through these social media forms. It's like the residue of their social media connections has given them a kind of like, you know, metaphysical affinity for each other. I think, I think it's more than that. I, um, uh, I mean, I hear what you're saying, uh -huh. and, and that's what we see in this book. You, I got the feeling they have more of a history than that. They've only been going out for a couple of years. We do right. know that, right. and so <clears throat> you never know. However, <clears throat> the very first time it comes up, their relationship and their how they relate to each other, when she's talking about, oh, somebody got her a room at this at the Creon, you know, yeah. and and he's he, you know, and then he tells you, know, he says, I immediately felt the the automatic it's not the automatic jealousy but the automatic reaction to tamp down what the jealousy i knew was coming right which right. It's, it's nice it's an interesting way of, de of de uh, describing it yeah he's self um he, he's self-reflective right um and and it just goes on from there well and these these are finely calibrated people i mean yeah. they're as calibrated as their as their machines they know how to exist in a relationship and as characters they're incredibly self-aware yes mm -hmm. And well, well, they're 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 narcissistic, but mm -hmm. but still, you know, like empathetic towards each other, you know. But and towards other people. Yeah, yeah, and uh, but and I I feel like whenever the technology comes up, I mean, and perhaps it's that you know the the book has such a cinematic feel by its very nature, but uh, it feels like whenever anyone's whipping out their technology, it turns into a commercial and. <laughs> And there's just this fetishistic, they love their technology. And, and naming it. Yes. And, and all, using the proper numbers. Right. And doing that over and over and over again. It's not the voice recorder, it's the Niagara. Right. And it's like, you yeah. know. And especially with the cameras. I mean, the camera yeah. porn in this book. I, you know, I only have the vaguest grasp of what. Yeah. I have no idea what they're talking about. No, I, I yeah. enjoy when someone is an expert, which he clearly is. Right. And they can talk about something, and it feels mystical in a way. Yeah, like I have to take it at the, the character's word that if they had the next model, they could do this thing that right. they couldn't do 
in the present right, scene. Right. Well, right. And, and when they speak about how, you know, the lens that they're using, like, affects their gaze, mm -hmm. how they modify their filters mm -hmm. so they can see, remember things a certain way. Yeah, and there's this incredible scene where, is it, uh, it's, I can't, well, fill the... Yuki? Or, what, is Yuki? Yuki? Where Naomi is, is looking at the film of, that Nathan has taken of a woman that he has slept with. Mm-hmm. And, oh, and she can tell. She yeah. can tell that it's that like by, by, by his right. camera position, right. his, his yeah. uncertainty. Oh, oh on, on Chase. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. He's filming Chase at her tea party. That was that was brilliantly party. described. Yes. Yes. She could read his uncertainty going forward, and then her by her openness, his the rel the relaxation of his posture by the picture that he'd taken. And yeah, the, and she could tell his relationship with her. Yeah, yeah. and yeah, what, cool. uh, you know, in a camera giving the most, uh, you know, objective possible view of all the different ways to kind of communicate our perception of something, it's, um, he can she can tell that he's, you know, in his you know, in some sense falling in love with her. Mm -hmm. Because Just, it's not objective at all. Yes. Yeah. yeah, like the choices that we make about how things are framed and what we zero in on affect our perception and our personalities and kind of define us. And, uh, and yeah, and the way that all the characters are, you know, the, like the older, the, uh, the, I mean, we have just this assemblage of mad scientists. I mean, it seems like with every chapter we're being led into a different dubious clinic mm -hmm. and, um, where dubious disciplines are being practiced, but that all the, uh, the old men are, are, you know, they, they want to know more about photography. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> or, you know, they, or they want to, uh, yes, plug. Yeah, they all, they all talk about oh. the technology in some way. Right. And whether uh, they know about it or they're curious about it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I find it interesting. Um, a lot of technology in the modern novel is often a problem and it's been talked about a lot. How, how, you know, it's something which is basically Dickensian, this mm. form, how you have a cell phone and how you have right. Skype, uh, and Cronenberg's really gone for it, and and often often the um, often it can feel superficial, but not here. I think right. he really he really understands these technologies. He understands he didn't just go on Skype to see what it felt like. Right. He, he knows it. he yeah. knows what what it feels like to to hear the Skype phone ringing and to right. need to answer. It. Right, right, yeah, and that's you know, and feeling like the author is a man of the world and he's steeped in this culture that he's describing. Um, you know, and, uh, I, I mean, the, the modernness of these relationships, not just, um, Naomi and Nathan's, but, uh, the Arosta guys mm -hmm. are, uh, just such wonderful characters to me. And I mean, as heinous, I mean, their, their relationship leads to what would seem to be cannibalism. Um, it's involved, they're involved in all sorts of, um, uh, amoral peccadilloes with their students and whatnot. But, uh, the transactions that they make with each other and the fact that they've had this this philosophical romance for decades, these academic celebrities that uh, that allow spaces in each other's lives for uh, spasmodic, life-warping epiphanies. They, like, and they, yeah, go ahead. Like we're making dangerous political decisions this year because, you know, because... Or you know, I am. Yes. And you're, and you're gonna go with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And they have to be French. Right. <laughs> yes. They have to be French. Yes. Because well, yes. they, they also allow each other what they call lacunae, yes. which is it, uh, physical and romantical departures it, from each other. Feels, that they'll, or the understanding that right, they come back. Which also it, suggests insect life. And if I, if yes. they weren't French, we wouldn't we wouldn't buy them as characters. We right. would say this is implausible. Yeah. Ha Somehow. Yeah. Well, in a way, Naomi and Nathan do that, but they do that separately. Uh -huh. And there's this discount, like, I, I felt like they were kind of juxtaposed, the two couples, because Nathan and Naomi, and even when they reference their sex life, they, they are doing two totally separate things when they are, come together and mm -hmm. they are intimate. She talks about his theme sex and how she knows something else entirely is going on in his head. Mm -hmm. And she's just not even there. She's just allowing him to do that. And the unsporting way that he ejaculated in her mouth un, un, that oh. without letting her know. Without letting her know. <laughs> yeah, they, they have <laughs> rules. And, and yeah, yeah. He broke, he broke <laughs> right. the rules. Right, yeah. right, right, right. Little little etiquettes. Yeah, and um, and it's interesting the uh, the nationalities of these characters. How you know Nathan and Naomi seem supremely modern because they come from like 
kind of cultureless cultures, you know, mm -hmm. or that are just kind of these collages of other cultures that have national identities, but is soon like an American who travels the world, you know, is is like a certain type of person. But that the Frenchness of the Arosta guys, um, you know, you would think that being cosmopolitan and being able to just blend into any culture would just be this would make you superior to people who seem entrenched in their national identity but you can see how their frenchness engulfs you know and engulfs these characters and how mm -hmm. you well, know and how he goes somewhere else to be engulfed by japanese-ness yeah. well and how canada <laughs> uh -huh. is the mix of the american and french right um and yeah that was really well observed i thought yeah it, well it, and there was a lot of french nationalism in it too which i right. really appreciated it was just it was hilarious yes uh, how well we can't. He may have eaten his wife, but he's a great man and belongs in the you know. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Academy yeah. Française, no matter what. Right. Yeah. It's yeah. Roman Polanski, come on over. No, yep. they don't get you. But yep. yeah. And but, the yeah. and the Japanese seem uh -huh. to express the same or are perceived to express the same right. feeling towards their own as well. I wanted yes. to. I wanted to go back. Um, somebody said something about their um, the Aristides, um connection on a on a higher plane or uh -huh. in philosophy. Right. Um, and it turns out in the end that at least her driving force is not, it's the technology. It's also love and, uh -huh. and, and the, um, uh, shoot, what's his name? Um, Rom. Rom. Uh, yes. But it's it, the whole, the, the whole uh, spy novel aspect of this book is about a 3D printer technology from North Korea. Right. Yes, that that to me was part of the humor that that North Korea is the, is the technologically advanced <laughs> nation, you know, to which uh, and also that they are just in the market for French philosophers. Right, but you know, but the, but it, you know, and that's it's a comical concept, mm -hmm. and at the same time, it, you know, it doesn't take you out of the book because right. it's who knows, like what you can like. Because their these... point is that they're hiding it, and yeah, and putting this, different names that, on this. That couch. kind of discussion right. that the, the the French philosopher who is sympathetic to a totalitarian, uh -huh. you know, maybe communist, maybe not regime. Right. That's that that kind of thing is a, is a national concern in France in a way that. If if an American academic went to North Korea, we wouldn't even know who he was. Right, right, yeah. right. It, it, Whereas it, in France, he's a household name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He's on TV. He's he's, yeah, yeah. he's attractive. He's sexy. Right, right. You know, and uh, yeah, if and the if Neil deGrasse Tyson went to North Korea, uh -huh. for instance, <laughs> <laughs> for instance, <laughs> and that's the closest we can think of right, right now. Uh, <laughs> um, well, yeah, the idea, you know, of a uh, a decadent international life of the mind, you know. I mean, it's fun. Yeah. It's yeah. we all hope this is true in a way. Uh huh. Sure. Sure. You know? Um the, the the events in the book? Yes, the, please. The international intellectual community. Mm-hmm. Um I mean I hope it is. Yes, as do I. And uh, so and so yes, Mark, um possibly that means that the events depicted in this book could actually happen. Uh -huh. But that's not so much what I'm talking well, about. That's, uh, and, uh, you know, it, it does feel like a science fiction book at times, but yeah. there isn't anything Im implausible in it. You know, I mean, um, emotionally No implausible. more implausible than things that we know about. Right, yeah, indeed. indeed. <laughs> right? So, yeah, it's very... The, the only one that is the is the... Brain exploding hearing aids at the end, right? Which we that can just totally happen. That could totally happen. We we can discuss this, but I think that one actually did happen in the <clears> book. <throat> you know, I think he did get sabotaged. Um, but um, you know, I'm just saying that that one right. pops up. I don't quite understand how that could happen. So but, okay, all right. So uh, yes, let's let's uh, talk about um, Aristide. Uh, Arosta guy? Mm -hmm. Am I pronouncing that correctly, do you think? I have sure. No we can yes. call him Ari. Let's Ari. call him Ari. Yes, yeah. Ari. yes. <laughs> um, so, uh, so his, the, like the amb ambiguity of what happens to him, what he's actually committed. I mean, he's very compelling right out of the gate in that he's, uh, you know, and he even makes a Hannibal Lecter reference, but he's this Hannibal Lecter-esque character, or how he's presented in the media as refined, decadent, great thinker and and a, a cannibal. He's done this horrible thing and killed his wife and eaten her. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which uh but the French are already sort of interpreting it poetically in their journalism as a, as an act of love and the great consummation of this amazing love affair. Mm -hmm. Sure, they uh, yeah, they, everyone's given her like met metaphorical cancer and, and that mm -hmm. it was a mercy mm -hmm. killing and that, you know, uh -huh. it was <laughs> their last great 
expression of love for one another. And don't we do that? Don't we do that for celebrities that we love? Yeah. Don't we? Don't we try and excuse them? Or, yes. Or take their side in some way. Well, oh, and not, and not, mm-hmm. oh, and, yes. And not just with celebrities. Um, you know, I, I feel like another theme in the book is the narratives around people, the uh-huh. narratives that yeah. you're made of and how, yes, for celebrities, we create these narratives and a, and a tweak in the narrative or an implausible plot twist can suddenly disconnect us from the celebrity. But the characters also make references to, to like shaping each other's narratives. Mm-hmm. Oh, very much. I yeah. loved, I loved the relationship between Naomi and Ari. I thought it was oh, that would, to me. I thought yeah. that's this is where we're getting to the meat of the meat of the cannibalism sort of <laughs> subplot, as it were. And I, I love that she's she's kind of aware of all of these things. She's seen all the police photos. She's kind of falling under his spell, sort of knowingly, sort of not. She's embedding herself as a journalist, and then when she finds out that he didn't actually kill and eat his wife. She's furious. <laughs> At first, she's like, she's falling under the spell of this, like, intellectual, you know, monster. And then she's like, I ah, just, it was a mercy fuck with an old man. Like, yeah. Ah. yeah, damn it. And that was the big letdown that he wasn't, that he wasn't a cannibal. But her, her, I love her interior um, observation of her own predicaments. And, mm-hmm. and um, you know, when she says, oh, so he, um, Nathan can, can make love with Chase and I can be doing Ari and who, and maybe Hervé for all he knows, and and then we can all meet up together, and it can be this. T- and she gets, she says, it'll be a new territory for us. It'll be, um, but she's not sort of naively naively thinking we are all of the same understanding. It's like this is dangerous. This could really be completely messed up, right. and that's exciting. And. I don't know what's going to happen. But, well, because yeah. it, it, she can feel the trajectory of all these plot arcs converging she's, on that she's point. Our, that it would yeah. make sense for that to happen. But it's, but it's, I like it. Yeah. I, the fact that she uh, keeps space open in her, in her world for these possibilities. Yeah. That, you know, whether they happen or not, it's just kind of how she's thinking about it. It's. I've just found it really interesting. Yeah. Well, they're. I mean, they're both uh, Nathan and Naomi are both careerists, right. but at the same time, I mean, they're. Career. I mean, it it the, the, it feels like those careers are almost tacked on. I write for Notorious Magazine. Uh-huh. I'm a medical journalist, and it's you know finances uh, and justifies their kind of wandering lifestyle and their densely mediated lifestyles. And uh, I think I agree with that. Yeah, that their career. Well, beyond that, beyond mm-hmm. their career, um, they're there's experimentalists. Certain, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, they they. They don't always make the best career choice. The 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 the, kind of, the idea might be this would be a great story, right. but but um, you know, sex is sex. Ra- well, the career is their rationale for being in these situations because right. there right. are there are it, a few now moments. Now it might be a book. <laughs> now so it the, might so be co- a video. The careerism right. is a flimsy yes. cover. Yes, like what am I doing in this insane situation in mortal jeopardy myself and in emotionally entangled yeah. with insane people? I don't know, but I like it. Yeah. yeah. Right. So Nathan is. <laughs> journalist and he it's pretty well laid out that he has this sexual obsession with women who are deathly ill with women who are terminally ill and, and then Naomi is just like adrenaline junkie uh-huh. who right yeah well I mean Nathan it seems to be like this revelation that he has this deep compulsive sexual attachment to like whoever he happens to be looking at I mean because there's the th- the terminally ill well, at the beginning but his obsession with Chase it's her, her like looniness. It, it, it's always, you know, something that's going to take him outside. I think they're both like mm-hmm. that. Like they're attracted to things that are going to take them past their paradigms and justifications. Um, but his his obsession with Chase is like so cute, and their flirtations. And you spoke French to me, and she slams the door. And in I his love face. all her little bug bites. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and he has fallen in love with her whilst watching her in like some fugue state, like at a making a cannibal tea party out of her own flesh and <laughs> playing out all the parts. And uh, yeah, it's like he, it's not someone he you know he's not aspiring to you know some to that decadent you know like uh, you know uber culture necessarily mm-hmm. of of globe trotting intellectuals. He he just he wants the weird. He He's wants... interested in the person too. Yes. I mean, the, yeah. Uh, what's in front of him? I think right. a, w- a weaker novel might have him trying to save her, or right. have yeah. or have yeah. Naomi trying to escape this situation. Like they've they've gone too far, and then they have to 
draw back. Right. But th- we never quite relate to them enough, I think, oh. for that to be the narrative because right. they, we're kind of disembodied. They're, they're disembodied at the beginning. From, so I, 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 so there's, there's something cold about them. Yeah. That yeah. They're, they, they don't really work as emotional avatars for us. Right, right, well, For right. me, anyway. Right. Well, um, and, and, I, and that's something that, that, uh, that really felt like, like Ballard to me. Yeah, uh, and that, definitely. Yeah. You know, and, defi- and like beyond a shadow of a doubt in Cronenberg's treatment of Ballard mm-hmm. in Crash, which... Uh, it's very passive. Yeah. Crash. Yeah, it's, it's structured like a uh, porno film, you know, where the, the Ballard character basically is led from one disturbing sexual situation to the next and he you know he's had a traumatic experience his you know he's been in this car crash and has become erotically fixated on it and on the woman whose husband was killed in the crash um in the opposite car and uh so uh but um the aspect of uh of the Ballard character in that film and his wife um are constantly having affairs and incorporating narratives about these affairs into their sex play. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and it felt like these two, but these two seem to be having more fun. Everyone in that, in that Ballard situation. Well, is that's kind of where like, I think yeah. that um, um, the crash, the movie was controversial. Not uh-huh. that it was, you know, now he's fucking a wound. Right. It was more like, I don't understand how these people feel right. about this. There's something ambivalent about what they're doing. Right, right, that, right. That's scary. Right. When it comes down to it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that's what... Well, and that's and so that's something, you know, in this book, um, in the characters, but also in the prose. And I think mm-hmm. this has come up already. But yeah. this, uh, I mean, it's cinematic prose, but it's not, I mean, it's not like, you know, you could do that in a Technicolor sprawling way. You can be setting scenes, pageants, Segwaying, you know, getting us to know the, you know, the locations more, but it's 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 like forensic and obsessive. Like I feel like the same voice that's describing the contents of the camera camera bag with such like swooning, you know, consumer fetishism is also is looking at the rooms that way, is looking at the interactions between the characters. There's that lots way. of great descriptions of the way somebody walks into the room uh-huh. the way somebody is cutting pork chops just these these tiny details that um all uh they're not wasted i right. don't think it's right. not it's not superfluous yeah now you were you're starting this by saying that in the movie crash it was yes. controversial because we didn't understand what these people were feeling. Well, what, like, like, in the Ballard yeah. It, yeah. original, what, was it the same? Um, well, it, it's it's much more it's much more interior, but there's that that same ambivalence. It's talking uh, about a madness shared by these characters, this very specific psychopathology, and um, so you know, almost like the disease in this yeah, book. Yeah. It's like it's affecting mm-hmm. these characters, now, but it re- doesn't render judgment. So are you saying that this is similar and that we don't understand why they do things or because for me I did I felt like I was definitely understanding. Yeah. I think yeah. The characters yeah. frequently don't understand why they're doing things. Yeah, but right. they let us know that. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. I True. Well, I know I I feel like we do we are led into their inner lives. We do understand what compels them, but the book renders no judgment. It's just mm-hmm. if someone, mm-hmm. you know, someone who is not David Cronenberg Let's make a movie about people yeah. who are sexually obsessed with car crashes. I must. Uh, There's no uh, guilt. No one yeah. in this book ever seems to feel guilty about yeah. anything that's happened. Right. Now, there are right. some hilarious moments where people get caught, you know, caught in a lie. My, one of my favorite, the, where, where Ari refers to Naomi as the, his priestess. After, she, <laughs> yeah. after he finds out that, that she, has, she has keyed in on Chase, he cannot figure out how that happened and that it wasn't a conspiracy to entrap him, titillates him to no end. But yes, his, his response is, "Oh, Ari's been caught in a great big lie." Yeah, it's, it suits <laughs> his own narrative. Right. It, 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 it just feeds his own um, now, arrogance in a way. Now yeah. about that, um, what does everybody think about why they're so, why these stories are so tightly wound? Is it coincidence that he gets parodies from this woman, what? or does what? she? deliberately have it and does the surgeon well that that's i mean that question that is you know that's a great question like kind of the crucial question with like what is this world made of that these characters are Mm -hmm. in like how what are the laws of physics here and in that way 
it seems to be part of that skein of of Borges and Nabokov and Calvino. Is it all, where, it's all North Korea, isn't it? Because Ari's not in on it, and and he gets it in the end. Right. So is it Celeste, Celestine, and well, Mom? Y- uh, when, Do you when, know what I'm saying? Right. Well, but right. I, I feel like um, to me, when the characters, uh, when Naomi, when it, the characters start um, suffering from this venereal disease, yeah. Um, and one of the uh, symptoms of the disease is increased uh, paranoia and uh Oh, and, I don't remember that. Oh. Yeah. Um, oh, the Roy- Roy's yes, disease. The Roy's so there's disease. Oh, yes. Roy's disease. Oh, Roy's. Not par- Paranese, right? Right. 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 Paranese yeah, was that's the, right. That was the right, right turn to go on. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, I, you know, and, and I, I can, um, when they're cutting back and forth between Nathan and Naomi, I felt like um, their speculations were reflecting that. Mm-hmm. And the the book doesn't really follow through, except in so far as all the information that we get gets more and more paranoid and convoluted, mm-hmm. dubious, and then things that can't be true. And why is he making that up? Those those like we get evidence of those things and things that seemed like plausible, you know, subterf- you know, uh, explanation or exposition, you know, becomes totally false. So I I think um, uh, this is it's 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 uh, it's it's a prism it's a beveled prism of a place um, you know like the coincidence factor I mean all of this just it had it had to happen the way that light has to bounce a certain way inside of a inside of a prism. I want it to be more constructed than that I think. Uh, mm-hmm. To me, I, I know what you're saying. It's all oh. fate, blah blah blah. It, that seems a little specious to me in this. In this, well, no, I think not in an obsessive mindscape. I mean, that, I mean, that, that's you know what it felt like to me mm-hmm. that that urban narrator who is not present in the book except when oh he is going to put an uh, uh, an Ari mask on for a few chapters. I mean that he uh, the voice that's building this world has already revealed itself as being so deranged, obsessive, and yet unaffected that um, when the different facets of the story and the backstory start kind of reflecting each other, commenting on each other, deconstructing each other, it's just we've just we're just trapped in an elevator with someone who's been going crazy, and we just realized, you know, I'm just looking for it to make more to more sense. Maybe. Well, that's what uh, there's an yeah. interesting choice he makes halfway through, where we get. Ari's voice uh-huh. for several chapters, right? Um, and and for me, I felt that was an acceleration. Uh-huh. I felt like I was really in Ari's head. Uh-huh. Um, it, um, there was a it, it made what seemed before and afterwards uh, a bit more composed and reserved. Right. And Ari is giving us his account, and it's passionate. Yeah, yeah. Uh, false or true, however it may yeah. be, um, of this. Of his version of events, it, it just threw things forward. That's where I really felt the Burroughs influence. Where uh-huh, he, right. that's where you feel the, you know, the the um, international um, uh, conspiracy conspiracy yeah. uh, really coming in and combining with with a sexual one, an intellectual one. Right. That's where you can see um, he makes it obvious that the only thing they could ever do was cut off. Uh, his wife's left breast. He, he, you know, in his mind, it's clear that's yes. the only way this could go. Right. And I thought that was a brilliant section. Um, I wondered how everyone else felt about that choice to to make the middle of the book. Yeah. This first person account. Right. And how that panned out. Um, Normally, goodness. that would have irritated the hell out of me and seemed like a departure. But the way, uh, you know, Ari's voice, and that was a big question for me in this book, is whose voice is this book actually in? Because it seemed like a consistent voice, and it seemed to be consistent with Ari's voice mm-hmm. in that passage. But um, I don't know what I'm talking about. I don't know. I, that's an interesting point. Some mm-hmm. authors uh, have trouble writing, and, you know, they it's their voice, mm-hmm. and so all the characters are going to kind of be similar to each other in their interior way of talking. So... But this is an interior that 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 he's telling that right. He's telling it. So, so, so we're aware of a performance. In yeah, a way. there's a couple right. of in interruptions she right. does in the middle, just to. But yeah. it's a confession. Yeah. Like the whole thing is a confession. So yeah. it's not necessarily right. as irritating as if you'd gotten three chapters of and this and then this happened and then this. Mm-hmm. Right, right, right. Yeah. Um, well, I, I I also felt that acceleration, and suddenly it's like it had been building to this, and now you know now we're in the skin of this thing. But there's still that cool, what's the truth, and mm-hmm. what's his agenda in saying this aspect. 
but then when we came out of that, um, I mean, I'm I'm willing to accept it and wonder about it as an aesthetic effect. But um, what a super oblique ending! Yeah, well, Come I on. well, I wondered. This I is what this, this is where I was going with this. Is that mm-hmm. I I found that um, his uh, Ari's. And her voice gives you these these great ideas, this passion. You feel the love for his wife. You really feel how much they care, as misguided or or not as their actions may be. Uh. Um, but after that, it felt like we were left with a series of explanations, uh-huh. and that um, none of which satisfied because nothing could match the the his account. Right. Um, and so, coming out of that. Where we'd had this acceleration coming out of that, felt then that the last few chapters were disjointed in a way. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, still full of fascinating stuff, and I'm yeah, glad to absolutely. know more about all absolutely. of these characters. But and you know, and then we're sort of in this cul-de-sac where everyone sort of seemed to trail off into different directions that seem kind of like prime to converge again, but but that we don't get to see that like something. Is it um, aimed prime for a sequel? Right. That I I didn't feel that. No. Um, no. Obviously. It seemed. I, I I'm, and that's the thing. I like. There's such authority in the way he's conducted himself. You know, um, writer wise, throughout. It it makes me wonder. Like, what's his choice? Like, what? Why was that choice made? Mm-hmm. And and perhaps we could have him here on Book Circle Online and ask him. That would be wonderful. Well, it is. It's weird. I mean, it's weird the way everyone sort of spirals into this sort of. Not exactly coming to it, like where everything seems really interrelated and then it just kind of spins out. I, I think I felt that I enjoyed the speculation of what might be happening more than the possible explanation. Uh-huh. And I wonder if he feels the same way as right. a writer. He doesn't want uh-huh. to resolve that, it. That uh-huh. throwing up these possibilities of, you know, is, is this. Is this a North Korean plot all along? Is is this right, right. a deranged killer? Right. I, I I'm and I maybe this is where I have a problem as a writer as well. Is it's how you finish something. Uh-huh. It, it's it's really hard to finish. Or something. is it just yeah. Celestine and Rom running away together somewhere that's not North Korea not at North all? North Korea. But, yeah. yeah. Who knows? Right. Well, my question there then is why is it why is Rom so upset by the fact that he three D three D faxed through his computer the image of Hervé's penis, why, why, when Hervé did that to both Rom and Chase, why is Rom so pissed off? That he sent it to him? That he sent it to Chase? Because Celestine and Hervé were lovers? Maybe. See, seriously, yeah. It's because it suggests maybe that this plot, the whole um, faux murder, mm-hmm. um, was is exactly that, uh, a faux murder. But doesn't Rom already know that? I mean, Rom does, but the world doesn't. And if you start, if you start sending, if he's if he's suddenly aware, oh, you're sending uh, pieces of yourself in, in 3D to Canada. But it's um, to Chase. She she was there. So, but Chase is right. the one. But see, he's sending it to Canada. Chase it's, is it's the weak digital. link, right? Chase is the one. She uh, ostensibly she's the only one who committed cannibalism at right. Cel- Celestine and Ari's behest. Right. She's the only one who actually took a bite out of the left one yep. <laughs> and ha- has become completely unhinged because of it. Yeah. She's got this, which I, it, it's like a, this side story about Royf, Dr. Royf, who had discovered the, the, this, uh, this devastating venereal disease. And the, the Nathan story is initially going to be, what do you do when the big disease you've discovered? And I, I, I when your name, when your name is like, like Mr. I love Alzheimer. that. I love that. Me this too. Guy who's, it's funny. Is his yeah. problem that the mm. fact that his name is attached to a disease, or is his problem the fact that that disease no longer exists? Yes. Yeah, no one gets it anymore. He's, so he's, he's not. He's ecstatic that his daughter has lost her mind because uh. now he gets Roy syndrome. Yeah. He's going to have a whole new, <laughs> right. have a whole new disease with his name on it. Um, but, but I think even more so that 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 Hervé has has sent. The files of the bo- the fake body parts, mm-hmm. Celestine's fake body parts, to so he's building this connection, this network. It's to all explain. there if someone wants to piece it together, right. as absurd as it might be. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah. And that the police could not tell the difference between a pile of movie props just because there was that one real breast in there. That well, threw it, them all, all that, the I think it was totally plausibly explained with the technology. You know, they took right. these photos, they grained them up, they made it look like crime scenes. So right. you automatically assume. And so it's it, so grotesque, it, it shocks everyone. Into at it. its core, it's a ridiculous murder mystery, isn't it? Yeah. In which this this... The one thing that seems impossible at the beginning is that this person who has been eaten uh, is alive. It's and just, yet, yes, and yet, did this man kill her? The, you know, that's the question. But yeah, but no, you're kind of sure it did happen from right, the beginning, right? Yeah, that is kind of without question. Yeah, because we we end up the, the whole thing is about why the why of it. Well, and there's lots of baiting and switching, and mm-hmm. you know, and yeah. it just like the whole sort of espionage aspect in general. I mean, um, that's. I mean, I, I think. That happens in a few Cronenberg films where it's sort of how the plot is structured, the spy thing, and we have to find these things out, and nothing is what it seems, but it feels beside the point. Mm-hmm. You know, it, I it, agree. It, it yeah. feels like, like the camera keeps looking over yeah. here. I think that's where he's, he's using corner. devices that we're really familiar with yeah. that are almost hoary cliches, right. and yet he's putting something else on top of that. Well, yeah, and if, if, like, if these plot lines were all resolved in some espionage ending, it, uh, yeah. it, it might it would we be would a lesser book. Out, yeah, we would walk out of it as book. a spy novel. You yeah. know, that, yeah. the whole thing about how he fooled us into thinking that that murder thing did happen, because he basically sort of told us it did, and then, oh, near the end of the book, they're saying... Or in the middle, when mm. when Ari's telling his story, he's yeah. all, "Well, yeah, we just put it out on the internet, and people believe it." And we're like, "Yeah, those stupid people." <laughs> uh, but that was us. Yeah, mm-hmm. at yeah, the beginning of the yeah, book. <laughs> right. Yeah, <laughs> it was great. Well, right. and I love that it's it. It seemed that it was going to be a horror novel at the first. You know, it, it's so. But but to me, I think it almost. It, it's almost post horror in a way. Like there's so many tropes in here, and and everything mm-hmm. is like, like from the first scene when after Nathan sleeps with Dunya, the the woman mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. with the experimental breast cancer treatment, mm-hmm. and she asks him if he'll come back. If she asks him to come back and and strangle her, her while they're making love, if he would come back, and he immediately launches into this fantasy about strangling Na- Naomi while they're making love. Yeah. And in his mind, he's like, and, and fantasy Nathan knows that there will be no sex after this because uh-huh. this is the ultimate. And then it's just done. It's like yeah. all of these these things which which used to horrify people. It's we're just pa- it seems we're past it as a culture. Well, and now it's in way. your feed. And yeah. that, well, another example of that, I think, is when he first arrives and when he first meets Chase, and she opens the door to this big weird old house uh-huh. in Toronto. Right. He knows he's visiting this maybe crazy doctor and here's this young woman dressed in uh, what might be a nightgown saying you know what do you think my problem is why am i here i must be here because i'm a patient what's my problem and Uh and he guesses consumption and then she laughs at him yeah and but then it becomes clear that she does have consumption she does have problems (laughs) but it but it's set up uh, to say you you, i think she says consumption because he says you mean tuberculosis and she's like no consumption Uh but but the 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 (laughs) idea is that you're coming to the crazy house Uh and then that's debunked but then ultimately you know it may well be the crazy house right 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 another thing that made me think of those those horror movie tropes is when they're describing uh, the original cancer patient woman's breast would put in the um it had all these tubes coming into it and out of it like insect like right and it made me think of hellraiser with the yeah. things coming out of his head it made right. me think of those you know those that image right it was very uh well, familiar well in another aspect uh, you know uh, yes this horror image you know or these these horrible circumstances it's like business as usual in the mental lives of these people yeah mm-hmm. you know and it's you know like living in the way that it's, um, like we, you know, we discussed a, a few books recently with kind of apocalyptic settings or themes, whether, you know, the literal apocalypse of California or of sorts or the kind of metaphorical apocalypse in Dead Stars or what, but, uh, Annihilation. Yes, and Annihilation, yes. Um, but this, uh, again, I keep using the word urbane, but th- this just seems, yeah. Such a cufflink to just dapper, urbane way of dealing with apocalypse. That's <laughs> the is, element you yeah. live in. That's the shape of Which the world. Which seems to be where Cronenberg 
um, in his films anyway, has yeah. has gone right from this kind of splattery, messy, yes. y- y- earlier films right. to a more kind of buttoned down. Well, and as a person who has realized that you can have like obsessive fixations on certain images that left unchecked would completely deform your personality, mm-hmm. but you can put those cufflinks on and you can have all these different ways of communicating with people and you can be a judge at the Cannes Film Festival and you know, <laughs> right. get, get <laughs> eye <laughs> surgery so you don't wear goofy glasses it's, and you're this handsome, dashing that's man. That's my favorite sequence. Yes. The whole yeah. film festival. So funny. Uh, rant. So uh, funny. All of it. Brilliant. Yeah, Brilliant. all of it. I think my favorite sequence was Chase in the schoolgirl uniform. Cobbling together, yeah, the three D printed body parts of Celestine with multiple, you know, dozens of copies of his penis, penis, yeah, replicated in different sizes, and like, like thwack, well, <laughs> give it a turn in it. And, and Nathan's one criticism being that using the same penis with the same right turn was so- right. somehow lessened the effect, <laughs> rather than being organic, rather you know? than being confused or horrified by it. He it's he got repetitive. exactly what she was doing. Yeah, yeah it's like it was obviously a copy of the same one. Yeah. Do you, does she, is she going to ask me to, you know, do right. yeah, so maggots, right. Right. maggots go left and right. They go everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> it's aesthetics first and foremost with, you know, with mm-hmm. all these people, whatever, yeah. they, whatever they call it. Um, and uh, th- so d- uh, do we think Ari's dead? Does it matter? I do, actually. Uh, I do. Uh, just um, context clues. Uh, I'm a careful it reader. Right. It just, obviously, it doesn't matter. But, matter. but yeah, uh, I do. What do you think? Right. Um, yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd buy that. I think, in I fact, think I wasn't sure until you said it with such certainty, and then I thought about I it. I think yeah, Rom you know. did it because he went <coughs> Celestine for himself. Right, yeah, like that. Um, Plain and simple, I think it's a love story. Uh, and, uh, and indeed, uh, As opposed on many to levels. Earlier when I said well, plain and simple, yeah. it's a Korean high-tech spy story. Re- well, yes, and it, it wears that drag from time to time. And it's, uh, it's a story of consumption. Um, in every possible way, and I love the way that every facet of the story plays on that word and its yeah. derivation. But yeah. not in a in a corny way. No. I really, really appreciated um, what I have to say is his light touch uh-huh. with all these grotesquely yeah. extreme things he's talking about. You have to have a light touch, yeah. otherwise it's just comical. Well, and even his light touch with these, you know, rarefied intellectual circles and like the, you know, the absurd, he, he knows hilarious titles about. he yeah. does. But of, he's also yes. making fun of it. He's yes. like, oh, the intellectual da 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 da. But that, but that's an important yet, point. Is that yeah. is that he, um, he he. He walks the line because he makes fun of of a world that he also clearly has has loves, just like the technology. Right. I mean, he he's not just laughing. At the beginning, it felt like Naomi oh. and Nathan right. were ridiculous, but it became more yeah. apparent that, that he empathizes with these right. people. It's not satire in yeah. any way. It's like uh, I I live this way myself, and it's yeah. absurd. Yeah, you know, and um, um, and not even desperate with that. I mean, uh-huh. Kind of. It okay didn't feel with that. Right, yeah. Na- you know, yeah. when other famous people write books, right. or even non-famous people write books, and they want to portray this rarefied air, they name drop. Yeah. They, the only thing he name dropped was technology. Um, all the canned oh, people he, did, he was no, talking about. No, he did about. mention... He did mention philosophers. Yeah. Right. That's, well, that's he what did mention authors. Right. But, but he also made some up, which is... Exactly. And it wasn't celebrities. It wasn't the kind of name dropping. Yeah. You know, the two times were with Hervé, who said, that's a, Chan- that's a Gucci suit. And, you know, you know, oh. and it was like that. And that was Hervé doing that. Right. Because he's a neophyte. He's sure. learning how to be this way. Right. But right. it was, it wasn't, yeah, n- name dropping philosophers doesn't have the same ridiculousness as name dropping Jennifer Aniston. Right, right. Well, uh, and I, l- I love. I'll go. Oh, well, uh, but it, it conjures a world in which in which uh, these philosophers are as glamorous, you know, are yeah. more are yeah. more so, right? Because they, cause, which is awesome. Because like a really smart called, people, a world called go, France. Yes, a world called. France, I was indeed. I was sneezing the name Bruce Wagner because yeah. of the the yeah co- we heard you endless pages we heard of, you. Yeah, I know. Um, She's still making confused faces. <laughs> okay, because of the end- yes. endless pages of what? Of, of, uh, of dead stars. De- of star references. Oh, thank yes. you. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, but well, that was... Okay, now, Jason doesn't like it when I... Bruce Wagner no. is blurbed on the back of the copy he of the book is. I'm looking at. He is. They're friends, at. and uh, and Cronenberg's new film is uh, is is based partly on dead stars. Cool. Um, and, I, and I think that's an interesting, uh, in the terms of Cronenberg's career... Uh, something to me that was interesting about this book, I feel like, I mean, he, he kind of, was, despite all the explosions and of, of heads and, and uh, biomorphic mutations and whatnot, 
I think he was a very literary filmmaker, like right out of the gate. So when you say literary filmmaker, yes. what do you mean? I mean that um, uh, in conjunction with uh, you know a, a feel and, obs- and an obsession with challenging images, that those um, those films, even the drive-in films, are filled with ideas mm-hmm. and uh, people engaged with and motivated by um, ideas. Yeah. And uh, and everyone is a is a scientist or is a victim of some scientific breakthrough or they're coping with a disease. But everyone is engaged in something that is extremely physical and visceral, but at the same time is very abstract. The philosophy of science. I mean, look at the fly or whatever. The right, fly sure. is a great yeah. example where, yeah. a, as much as he's horrified by what's happening to him, he's actually very curious. Yeah, he's super there's curious. a great right. great scenes of him looking in the mirror and just pulling yes. off parts yeah. of his skin. All of the with, with curiosity, not, yeah. not with horror, just with curiosity right. and that that's something that is I, fascinating I, and i feel like it you know, it's in all of these yeah. characters yeah. the the films he's made um based on on particular books or um like naked lunch and crash and uh cosmopolis in this uh in which he interfaces with don delillo and this new film coming out where he interfaces with bruce wagner it feels to me, having read this book, like he was, um, he's acquiring knowledge. He's like processing the influences of these, of these writers. That his objectives in the, in the context of his cinema are, you know, are fundamentally literary. You know, he's a surrealist in a sense, but not like David Lynch, who's a painter and just wants to lead you to a place of silence and stillness where you can be affected by an image. But with, uh, with Cronenberg, I feel like he was, Learning how to uh, how how to be himself as a writer and by wrestle making these and films. wrestle and wrestle with those ideas. Yes, and that's yeah. why maybe I can fill all, all of those films yeah. in the yeah. in this work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, and seems to honor those influences in a very organic way. Mm-hmm. Like it's yeah. the first time they've all been kind of working together in conjunction. So I hope this means more David Cronenberg books. Because yeah, bravo! Yeah. I yeah. really I, I I agree. I think he's a fine writer. Um, you know if. We've been almost 100% positive in our review of this book, yeah. which is so unusual for us. <laughs> right, I know. That I feel I must reiterate my one thing from the beginning, which yes. I did get irritated about all the technology right. um, name dropping. Right. And that may just be me. Well it, well, it did seem for me to be painting, and Naomi in particular, as, as a consumer, b- above and beyond everything else. And so I had, I thought she was being painted in a slightly two-dimensional way. Um, as the as the book went on, I realised that they're both fairly two-dimensional, but that's absolutely okay uh-huh. because um, we don't have to worry about their morality as much, which allows the book to unfold. Right. Um, right. So, so I I had misgivings near the beginning that um, I fell away. Right. Um, because he, when he's talking about cameras, he's describing why this camera is going to work and why this one isn't going to work. Oh. And I... Well, that was interesting, but he kept yeah. using their brand names and their numbers and right. their letters. And yeah. fine, I just... And I hear what you're saying about, well, it, it reassured you that he was an expert and he knew what he was talking about and you right. just accepted it. Right. I just accepted it too, but it, my, my eyes kind of crossed every time I, every time I it's, ran across it's, it, it's, it again. It, it's their again. passion. It's their... When they have no other passion, that's their passion. Right. You know? Well, I, you know, I, I felt like when that first came up, I, um, I anticipated more of it, but that I, an, I expected that it would have an American psycho effect where, okay, mm-hmm. these people are so alienated that mm-hmm. it's just their thing. Right, so right. I, I anticipated I more of that. I didn't get that that was just their passion. Right. No, but what I mean, what I think for me is that... I'm sorry, it, I it, it, a, a strength is that yeah. they, they are not rounded characters for me. Oh. I think that actually works in, the fa- in their favor. At first, I thought they were going to be parodies. Oh. They're not. Right. Then I thought that they might become these caring human beings. Um, they're not. They're kind of narcissistic. And that was perfectly fine for the the bigger story, which wasn't them, I think. Right, I think right, it was right. the, uh, some of the other characters well, around them. And that's and to me, uh, it's it's interesting. Like the, their con- the contrast between them and um, and the uh, Arasti Ar- 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 guys. Mm-hmm. Um, there's this thing of North American people, American and Canadian, and and French people. Mm-hmm. European people, old world people, old guard intelligentsia, and they're these flashy internet sort of like people. Um, 
it it's like uh, these European people, um, their their narratives are suffused with torment, all these great passions and these blustering, you know, um, things. Whereas, I, you know, Naomi and Nathan, I I don't. It, it feels like they're not shallow necessarily to me, but that um, there's they just have no torment. They're driven mm-hmm. by curiosity. Yeah. They're pleasure seekers. They haven't had their great tragedies yet. They have. They have yeah. superficial torments. Yeah, jealousy. Exactly. Right. Very much. Right. Very right. much. Right. Yeah. Ch- childlike ones. What and that, that's that? that's where the um, sorry, uh, to me that's where I thought of Lolita. Uh huh. The, right. the 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 Europeans who are thinking about these things. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And the yeah, Americans yeah. who seem like they can't feel pain until ultimately we realize. Right. By the end of Lolita, that they, they can feel they pain. They can feel. <laughs> and they're the pain. victim. Yes. Yeah. 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 What were you going to say, Christy? That's just that. That was the, my complaint. I think is that I I do not understand what what the appeal for Celestine or Ari would be in North Korea, being that they're driven by they're very passionate. They're very, you know, they they're very exploratory. They're libertines. They're you know, what would appeal well, to them? About do we know society? they are in North Korea? Well. I ultimately no, but I, I but this because remember this whole, when when uh, right. when uh, it was either hearing aid lady or the doctor hearing aid lady, right. hearing aid lady Elki <laughs> or yes. Matsuda um, uh, met with representatives. Well, but they weren't North Korean, but they were South Korean. But you know, I know that they represented. Right. I don't know that we actually know. Well, North I, Korea's I, in it at all. I I I feel like. Um, uh, but good point. That yes. Well, Tina. Um, is erotically obsessed with Rom. Mm-hmm. Rom went off on this whole Korean jag. I, I feel like the appeal of North Korea for her is, is him whispering through that screen. And there's, a, to, there's a taboo as we well. We have to accept that that yeah. actually There's happened, a taboo. They, right. they, like, yeah. they like busting these things open. They like right. doing things well, that are... And, and the, the subversiveness of these, I mean, they're like these sort of uh, hyper-intellectual apologists for consumer culture in Being the Baudrillard in vein where this is just how it is and look at, you know, the flashing lights and everything is open And the and idea empty. that the Koreans think they're critiquing that. Yes. Right. Because of their tone. Yeah. And, that they're, and they're hosting them. <laughs> right. So the, the Russian doll effect of them like being these you know like uh house, you could see how that might be attractive to an Hill. intellectual who was right. you know oh they think we are we're gonna the ultimate the communist thing. philosophers right. well let's go there and see what happens but, but you know but i, I think <laughs> like all the characters that's a marvelous intellectual rationalization for something that that you're you're viscerally driven to do right i mean it, right it's, right it's her obsession with rom it's his obsession with her it's just people being driven by sexual fascination, infatuation, and obsessive attachment to certain behaviors or rituals, and and I just, uh, um, whenever I get this this shudder, where I, I just it felt like you know this whole story was a storm of desire, despite how cold it was, mm-hmm. that everyone is just out of control chasing, you know whatever their kink is. I thought of this uh, scene in Existenz, where Jude Law. Is um, is receiving his uh, his Bioport implant, uh, which is a hole that's made in his spine, so that the Bioport can connect, can be connected with this jammy, slimy umbilicus. And uh, I remember sitting in the theater, enjoying the film up till that point, um, but the camera lingers on the tip of this umbilicus being rubbed in this jammy, slimy fashion around the rim. <laughs> of the bioport in his spine uh, for what felt like a full minute. And I, I felt like... It's called foreplay, Jason. Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and at the same time, it's, you know, there's a kind of climax to it because I felt like on some level the movie was made so he could do that. <laughs> He's telling the story yeah. so that we could experience because it's already been charged. What that It's not, oh, gross. It's what this umbilicus is, what it will connect you to, allowing something to enter you, to enter you physically. Video drone with a video cassette in your stomach. And that same, like, curiosity. Yeah. And what will it feel like if I let this happen? Yeah. And um, I guess, you know. And don't we all do that? Don't we do that with the internet, with technology? I don't know if I need this, but I wonder what it would be like to own this. What what would it be like to 
be part of this. And I know kind I of shouldn't passively, take on this, but passively I'm going to do that. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. And far from a critique of that culture, I mean, it, it's... Um, because that would be easier in a way to uh-huh. kind of just say this is ridiculous. We're right. all we're all we're all zombies. But to just say, okay, what if we are all zombies and yeah. maybe we still feel things? Right. Like yes. Yeah. No. So n- I mean, not a critique, not a celebration, just like an acceptance mm-hmm. of a a uh, a consumed culture. He's not very angry. Uh, no. No. He's fascinated. Yeah. And uh, amused. And I appreciate that point of view. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's contagious. I like it. Yeah. It kind of it kind of relaxes you. Yes. Actually. Yes. Yes. Indeed. So uh, yeah. Well, then I will all be uh, hooking up to uh, Cronenberg's um, pod shortly after we conclude tonight's podcast. No doubt. Oh my God! It all came true. It all came true. The pods, podcasting, all of it. <gasps> We're yeah. pod people. We're pod yeah. people. Um. My headset is it's stuck yeah. in my brain. I well, can't the, take it off. Yeah, no, that's and uh, doesn't. Yes. When are we going to get the embedded ones? By the way, Jason. I don't. Uh, soon, I hope. Okay. Because that's the teasy thing about uh, his vision, I think, and that it suggests that we could have like a more tactile interface with uh, with with these technologies that are. That's yeah. an interesting yeah. point. Yeah. It's always tactile. Right. Absolutely, that's they nice. They touch. They touch cameras. They touch screens. They leave. They leave prints on. Right. But, the, on lenses. but the fact that when you can print the stuff out, then it's there in front of you. Yeah. And I mean that's yeah. There's right. sounds like what you're 3D saying. penises. You know? Well, and everyone and just the every boundary between. Um, you know, between the present moment and memory, between a, a real corpse and a 3D printing of a corpse, it's uh, yeah, it's um, it's fitting that uh, that a Rasta guy will be buried between uh, Sartre and uh, and Baudrillard, because mm-hmm. you know, between the uh, the raw nobility of existentialism and and the uh, the giddy, amoral, almost futile critique of the simulation. Um, for your for your intellectual pleasure. I have no idea what any of that meant. That was <laughs> Jason Scomata Esquire. See, this is where we prove that we're not French because we uh-huh. had to we had to end that uh-huh. with with a joke with well, yeah. with a bit of self. Well, I had fight. no idea what he was talking about. That's why. I didn't either. That's so what was beautiful. That, I don't know that that uh, portrays me as being unfrench as just uncultured. Well, yes. I'm not French. And isn't but isn't that Naomi get French? W- one one worry I love that throughout that's, the book. I love that. She, that is that she doesn't, a nice. She hasn't read books. She that's a nice. Know. That is a really nice uh, feature of her. They all have their own. It doesn't stuff. give her great angst, but just in in so in oh, situations where she realizes, yeah. if yeah. I'd read about this philosopher, I could have a better comeback. I right. loved that, and how she admires Yuki, who has the same ignorance for being able being able to take whatever they say and turn it and make it work for her. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But Naomi can't manage that. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, you know, and, and so, I mean, her kind of facile grasp of all this technology, it gives her certain superpowers, but there's a frequency of experience that's inaccept- inaccessible No, I think she's her. got a very deep grasp of the technologies. Yeah. It's the information that she has a facile mm-hmm. right, grasp right, of. Right, right, right. But she knows she can find it. She that's frequently, what, that's what's yeah. in the conversation, she's, right, she's right, right. Wikipediaing. She's, yeah. she's learning. But she only the read the first three summaries yeah, yeah, of the uh-huh. Argus yeah. stuff. <laughs> <laughs> which, which is actually enough up uh-huh. in most situations, which is one of the sad sure. things, perhaps. Except you're dealing uh, when you're dealing with people who have read whole books and might have eaten mm. each other. Or, or read yeah. whole, <laughs> whole books about yeah. eating each right. other. Right. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> that's dangerous territory. Naomi, Naomi get out. I love that she's Omi and he's Than. Yeah. That's so cute. <laughs> it's, um, it's good. Yeah. It's just light. It's not, the, he doesn't overuse that stuff. It's right. just, it gives you a chuckle and then yep. you move on. Yep. So, uh, so consumed by David Cronenberg. I think we have judged it uh, graceful, sure footed, creepy, sad, hilarious um, when it wants to be. And uh, um, yes, uh, oblique. At times, and uh, but mostly uh, fascinating, and we'd like to read more, more mm-hmm. books from the great man. Um, so uh, yeah, so so this, ladies and gentlemen, my bookish and circular lovelies out there, just reading up all them books out in Bookland, grooving on our podcast and grokking our conversation. I uh, I want to thank you all for tuning in to Book Circle Online. Uh, through whichever vector has been uh, most efficacious for your uh, consumption of uh, our product. And uh, I have been and will, no doubt, continue to be 
Jason Squamata. No uh, doubt. No doubt. Wow. No doubt. You can friend me on Facebook or tweet me at Squamata Pod if you are so inclined. You can leave comments on the YouTube version of this video, or you can uh, hit it up on iTunes, okay? And let's start a little conversation. We will read your comments. We will respond to them. Let's engage in a dialogue. Let us extend our tendrils through the wet holes of commerce and, and uh, knowing. But and for God's sake, skirt around the rim for just a few minutes. <laughs> just a few minutes. <laughs> just for God's for us. sake. All right. Just for politeness. For us. For, for Dave. For us. Um, and uh, so once again, it has been a great pleasure to be here with... Christy Lovato. And Christy, can they reach you some? No. No. Okay. <laughs> Christy wants to be alone. Um, she's with child. And French. Yes. And You're going to cut that part out, right? Yeah, maybe. Okay. Yeah, no, I will. Which part? Of course. Out? No, stop it. What, Come on. It's adorable. He's not going to cut the baby out. I, yeah. <laughs> Excuse yeah, me. No matter I mean, how you many times to. you ask, wow. no. <laughs> I'm not going to let you. Wow. Even if you watched a video. All right. Uh huh. Okay. When the mask comes off, all right, it might not be Dr. Surprise. Jenkins. <laughs> <laughs> you know how your doctor was out of town last time? <laughs> <laughs> that's all I'm saying. Uh huh. He's in Neverland now. Um, she doesn't think that's funny. It's weird. Come on now. Um, and uh, so, uh, and I have also been here. Not just with Christy Lovato, but also with Pat Janowski. <laughs> and and Pat, do you want people to reach out and talk to you through the web? Sure. Yeah. How yeah, would they do that? They could friend me on the old Facebooks. Okay. Sh- they you'd leave me a little note, say how you know me, because uh-huh. I pret- I prefer knowing why sure. people are friending me on right. Facebook. I'm one of those weird luddites. Okay, right. That's fine. Like the the Arista guys. Exactly. But if you say, I use The Aristocats. <laughs> like the Aristocats. I want yeah. to surround my bed with little pieces of paper with notes on them and pencils. Uh-huh. Sometimes I actually do. You can. But I don't always. Okay. Um, but yeah, if you do friend me on the Facebook, just drop me a little line. I'd like to know who's listening. Right on. Fantastic. And Mark? I just want friends. I don't want people to talk to me. And what's your name again? Mark Savage. Yes. And um, so you just want friends who don't talk to you. Yeah, don't talk to me. <laughs> Those are the best kind. Yeah. Okay, right. Do um, you want this Rem Mueller circling? Just like me now and again. <laughs> uh-huh, <laughs> right? Yeah. Okay, like him now and again. Like the man. Um, who, who wouldn't? Uh, so uh, uh, this has been fantastic. It has been a delight to read Consumed by David Cronenberg. Run out and get it. Um, as soon as you can, or having gotten it already, um, enjoy our podcast. And uh, is that having gotten Royfe's disease? Yeah, or? you can catch anything on this podcast. <laughs> and uh, plug right we, in. Yes, uh, we are Book Circle Online. We have been here through the good graces of AfterBuzz TV, Kevin Undergaro, and Maria Menounos. Wow. And uh, yes, uh, tune in for more podcasts and the podcasts of our uh, LA division, um, uh, flagship by uh, Jeff Remasters. Thank you very much. Good night. Keep it bookish, keep it circular, and keep reading alive. From managing editor Jason Squamata, executive producers Maria Menounos, Phil Svitek, and Kevin Undergaro, we would like to thank you for tuning in to Book Circle Online. For more discussion, go to bookcircleonline.com. And if you have comments, questions, or book title suggestions, write us at info at bookcircleonline.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this is Book Circle Online. BCO, join the circle. Uh, Nathan. Were you going to give a little overview um, of your impression? Oh, yeah, okay, well, my, yes. I'm interested to hear, that's why. Um, I, uh... I'm a, I'm a huge fan of his as a filmmaker. I was excited to read this. Um, and uh, I guess I had different expectations too, um, like Christy. Um, and I'm not sure what they were because I was, uh, as much as he plays upon his customary obsessions and themes, I was um, shocked and delighted by the humor of this book. I yeah, thought this yeah. book was hilarious. Me too. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's this special kind of like, comedy i hesitate to even but this humor of an extremely intelligent man who is who is uh very kind of compulsive and obsessive in the images that you know that attract him and that he finds resonant but uh but is also a sort of urbane man of the world Mm -hmm. you know you really get that feeling and uh and in that in that sense 
um, you know, people are comparing this to Nabokov and, you know, and, mm. and I can, I can see that in, uh, I think it's almost a satire of his previous obsessions uh-huh. with the fetish, like the fetishization and the like people being drawn into others' fetishes right, right, and, right, right. and obsessions. Yeah. Well, it, but it is, it has this, this, it, this weird balance where you can read it as a parody, but it, it is actually creepy. I mean, uh-huh. at least I found it so. It is, you know, emotionally affecting. And, uh, but um, I love the way he paints relationships me too yeah in in what feels like this like just uh you know sort of forensic modern way and uh and i can and i i know you know he's openly espoused you know the the burroughs influence and you know he's worked Mm -hmm. with burroughs material and the nabokov influence but uh the the ballard influence i feel like his literary imagination has been basted in jg ballard because it's the same and you can you know see it in his film of crash but this uh this sort of, um, yeah, a, a, a relationship between very sexual people, um, you know, sort of like post-moral people, career people who are connected by technology, immersed in technology. Naomi and, and Nathan. Yeah. Uh, well, Nathan. also the, the <clears throat> our, our, please pronounce that for me. You did it earlier. Arosta guy? Arosta guys as well yes. because yes. they're based on c- consumerism as they are. Yes, indeed. Yeah, mm-hmm. and the mm-hmm. way, I mean, I, I feel like... You but know. yeah, th- th- that it was, uh, they have these relationships. They're connected by technology, but that's only one tiny aspect of it. They're connected. Right. Yes, mm-hmm. yes. And, well, it, yeah. You know, and at times, and when they speak, um, uh, Naomi and Nathan, Nathan Math and Naomi Seberg, I love the names of these characters yeah. <laughs> so yeah. much. And... Uh, and the way that they're that when they speak of having a kind of, you know, telepathic link or a muted telepathic link, or the way that their stories kind of mirror each other, and we're seeing these separate narratives and these separate histories they're pursuing and unearthing, snaking around each other and feeding each other in such a delicate and creepy way, tightly wound. Yeah, yeah, and um, but it feels like. You know, that, that they have, like, principally a media relationship. You know, most of the time they spend together is through all these abstractions and mediations. And it's almost, it's not like they're so connected that that's why they have such an affinity through these social media forms. It's like the residue of their social media connections has given them a kind of, like, you know, metaphysical affinity for each other. I think I think it's more than that. I, um uh, I mean, I hear what you're saying, uh-huh. and, and that's what we see in this book. You, I got the feeling they have more of a history than that. They've only been going out for a couple of years. We do right. know that, right. and so <clears throat> you never know. However, <clears throat> the very first time it comes up, their relationship and their how they relate to each other, when she's talking about, oh, somebody got her a room at this at the Creon, you know, yeah. and and he's he you know and then he tells you know, he says I immediately. The is, point is that they're hiding it. Yeah, putting this, different names that, on this. That topic. kind of discussion right. that the, the the French philosopher who is sympathetic to a totalitarian, uh-huh. you know, maybe communist, maybe not regime. Right. That's that that kind of thing is a, is a national concern in France in a way that if if an American academic went to North Korea, we wouldn't even know who he was. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. It, it, Whereas it, in France, he's a household name. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He's on TV. He's he's, yeah, yeah. he's attractive. He's sexy. Right. Right, you know, and uh, yeah, if and the ne- I- if Neil deGrasse Tyson went to North Korea, uh-huh. for instance, <laughs> <laughs> for instance, <laughs> and that's the closest we can think of right, right now. Uh, <laughs> um, well, yeah, the idea, you know, of a uh, a decadent international life of the mind, you know, I mean, it's fun. Yeah, it's yeah. we all hope this is true in a way. Uh huh. Sure. Sure. You know, um, the, the the events in the book. Yes, the, please. The International intellectual community. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I hope it is. Yes, as do I. And uh, so, and so, yes, Mark. Um, possibly that means that the events depicted in this book could actually happen. Uh huh. But that's not so much what I'm talking well, about. That's uh, and uh, you know, it it does feel like a science fiction book at times, but yeah. there isn't anything Im- implausible in it. You know, I mean. Um, Emotionally, no impossible. more implausible than things that we know about. Right? Yeah, indeed. indeed. <laughs> right. So yeah, it's very the the only one that is the is the brain exploding hearing aids at the end. Right. Which we that can just dis- totally happen. That could totally happen. We we can discuss this, but I think that one actually did happen in the <clears throat> book. You know, I think he did get sabotaged. Um, but 
Um, you know, I'm just saying that that one right. pops up. I don't quite understand how that could happen. So, I, okay, all right. So, uh, yes, let's let's uh, talk about um, Aristide uh, Rostegai. Mm -hmm. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Do you think? I have sure. No we can yes. call him Ari. Let's Ari. call him Ari. Yeah. Yes, Ari. yes. <laughs> um, so, uh, so his the. Like the amb ambiguity of what happens to him, what he's actually committed. I mean, he's very compelling right out of the gate in that he's, uh, you know, and he even makes a Hannibal Lecter reference, but he's this Hannibal Lecter-esque character, or how he's presented in the media as refined, decadent, great thinker and, and a, a cannibal. He's done this horrible thing. And Killed I, his wife and he, eaten her. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Which, uh, but the French are already sort of interpreting it poetically in their journalism as, a, as an act of love and the great consummation of this amazing love affair. Mm -hmm. Sure. They, yeah, they, everyone's given her like met, metaphorical cancer and, and that mm -hmm. it was a mercy mm -hmm. killing and that, you know, uh -huh. it was <laughs> their last great expression of love for one another. Uh, don't, we do that? don't we do that for celebrities that we love? Yeah. Don't, we, don't we try and excuse them? Or, yes. Or take their side in some way. Well, oh, and not, and not, mm -hmm. oh, and, yes. And not just with celebrities. Um, you know, I, I feel like another theme in the book is the narratives around people, the uh -huh. narratives that you're yeah. made of and how, yes, for celebrities, we create these narratives and a, and a tweak in the narrative or an implausible plot twist can suddenly disconnect us from the celebrity. But the characters also make references to, to like shaping each other's narratives. Mm -hmm. Oh, very much. I yeah. loved, I loved the relationship between Naomi and Ari. I thought it was oh, that would, to me. I thought yeah. that's this is where we're getting to the meat of the meat of the cannibalism sort of <laughs> subplot, as it were. And I, lo I love that she's she's kind of aware of all of these things. She's seen all the police photos. She's kind of falling under his spell, sort of knowingly, sort of not. She's embedding herself as a journalist, and then when she finds out that he didn't actually kill and eat his wife. She's furious. <laughs> At first, she's like, she's falling under the spell of this, like, intellectual, you know, monster. And then she's like, I ah, just, it was a mercy fuck with an old man. Like, yeah. yeah, damn it. And that was the big letdown that he wasn't, that he wasn't a cannibal. But her, her. Consumed is the first novel from acclaimed Canadian filmmaker David Cronenberg. It's a visceral modern mystery, running riot with mad scientists, strange diseases, erotic philosophers, simulated cannibalism, and sleek, fetishistic technologies. Like Cronenberg's films, it seduces you into a dark place filled with hidden mirrors and challenges you to meet the gaze of your own obsessive reflection. Please join us for an elegant autopsy on the consumed edition of Book Circle Online. From the Library of Maria Menounos, this is Book Circle Online, featuring in-depth discussion, insight, news, and commentary on all the world's leading book titles and their authors. And now, Book Circle Online. Welcome back to Book Circle Online. I am Jason Squamata. I am here with my ravishing and brilliant co-hosts. Christy Lovato. Pat Janowski. And Mark Savage. And uh, this week we are discussing Consumed, the first novel by acclaimed filmmaker David Cronenberg, uh, director of uh, such um, mind-meddling, uh, muddling masterpieces as uh, Videodrome, Existence, The Fly, Dead Ringers, that sort of thing. Um, but uh, this is his first novel, and... Uh, uh, I think he's uh, he's always uh, he's always been a favorite of mine, and he's a he's a very literary filmmaker, and has uh, had an interesting relationship with adaptation and using other people's novels in his work, um, which we will talk about further. But uh, this is his first book, and uh, what thoughts have we on consumed, Christy? Um, I I really enjoyed this book. I I felt like you could you could sense his talent as a filmmaker in the book. Every Every scene was so richly described and every sort of set wa was so detailed that I really enjoyed it. It was not what I expected, which I imagine we'll get into in time. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I really I liked it. Excellent. Pat? I can't imagine what you expected. I, uh, I expected something shocking and disgusting and um, captivating, which this was. Hmm. Um, you know, the description, the cinematic um, nature of this book at at first 
maybe the first five to 10 pages though, that was it. I was really conscious of his description. You know, she stepped out onto the small square boundary. Da, 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 da. Everything was so richly described. It felt like, oh, come on, stop, you know, pleasuring yourself, Cronenberg. But it that all fell away. And I, I realized this just as you were saying that earlier, Christy, because, it, yeah, that it's it was grating just for a second. Mm. But then it really worked for me. Um, I, I do have to note that he is so much in love with his technology, mm. I found that to be quite intrusive, especially up the first two thirds of the book. There was every paragraph, there was a new, new brand name of something, right. which I know is part of the point of the thing, but. Right. Gotcha. Excellent. Mark? I, I'd like to think if I hadn't known this was a Cronenberg novel and you told me this was written by a famous film director that I would have been able to piece together and known that it was Cronenberg because it seems to hit on so many themes that he hits again and again. Yeah. There are insects and there is surgery and there's technology and they all kind of mix together. Yes. Um, completely meshed together. Um, I, yeah, I really enjoyed it. You couldn't put together the pieces? As it were. Sorry. Oh. Spoiler alert. Oh, uh, yes, there are body parts in the book. Mm. Or are there? Um, or are there? Mm. Good question. Which brings us around. Let's let's talk about the technology aspect. Because um, I... Uh, um, yet, I mean, obviously, it's part of the theme of the book. This, uh, um, you know, and... Uh, I, I mean, the, the modernness of these relationships, not just... Um, Naomi and Nathan's, but uh, the Arosta guys mm -hmm. are uh, just such wonderful characters to me. And I mean, as heinous, I mean, their their relationship leads to what would seem to be cannibalism. Um, it's involved, they're involved in all sorts of um, uh, amoral peccadilloes with their students and whatnot. But uh, the transactions that they make with each other and the fact that they've had this this philosophical romance for decades, these academic celebrities that uh, that allow spaces in each other's lives for uh, spasmodic life warping epiphanies they, like and they yeah go ahead like we're making dangerous political decisions this year because you know because because or uh, I am yes and you're and you're gonna me. go with it. <laughs> yeah. yeah and they have to be French. Right. <laughs> yes. They have to be French. Yes. Because well, yes. they, they also allow each other what they call lacunae, yes. which is uh, um, physical and romantical departures it, from each other. Feels, that they'll, or the understanding that right, they'll come back. Which also it, suggests insect life. And if I, if yes. they weren't French, we wouldn't, we wouldn't buy them as characters. We right. would say, this is implausible. Yeah. Ha Somehow. Yeah. Well, in a way, Naomi and Nathan do that, but they do that separately. Uh -huh. And there's this discount, like, I, I felt like they were kind of juxtaposed, the two couples, because Nathan and Naomi, and even when they reference their sex life, they, they are doing two totally separate things when they are, come together and mm -hmm. they are intimate. She talks about his theme sex and how she knows something else entirely is going on in his head. Mm -hmm. And she's just not even there. She's just allowing him to do that. And the unsporting way that he ejaculated in her mouth un, un, that was, without letting her know. Without letting her know. <laughs> yeah, they, they have <laughs> rules. And, and yeah, yeah. He broke, he broke <laughs> right. the rules. Right, yeah. right, right, right. Little little etiquettes. Yeah, and um, and it's interesting the uh, the nationalities of these characters. How you know Nathan and Naomi seem supremely modern because they come from like kind of cultureless cultures, you know, mm -hmm. or that are just kind of these collages of other cultures that have national identities, but is soon like an American who travels the world, you know, is, is like a certain type of person, but that the Frenchness of the Arosta guys, um, you know, you would think that being cosmopolitan and being able to just blend into any culture would just be this, would make you superior to people who seem entrenched in their national identity. But you can see how their Frenchness engulfs, you know, en engulfs these characters and how, mm -hmm. you well, know, and how he goes somewhere else to be engulfed by Japanese-ness. Well, yeah. and how Canada <laughs> uh -huh. is the mix of the American and French. Right. Um, and yeah, that was really well observed, I thought. Yeah, it, well, and there was a lot of French nationalism in it, too, which I right. really appreciated. It was just, it was hilarious. Yes. Uh, how, well, we can't, he may have eaten his wife, but he's a great man and belongs in the, you know, yes. uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Academy Francaise, no matter right. what. Right, yeah, it's yeah. Uh, Roman Polanski, come on over. No, yep. they don't get you, but yep. yeah. And, but, the, yeah. And the Japanese seem uh -huh. to express the same, or perceive to express the same right. feeling towards their own as well. Uh, I yes. wanted to, I wanted to go back. Um, somebody said something about, they're um, the Aristides um, 
connection on a on a higher plane or uh-huh. in, in philosophy. Right. Um, and it turns out in the end that at least her driving force is not it's the technology. It's also love and uh-huh. and, and the um, uh, shoot what's his name um, Rom Rom. Uh, yes. But it's it, the whole the the whole spy novel aspect of this book is about a 3D printer technology from North Korea. Right. Yes, that that to me was part of the humor that, that North Korea is the, is the technologically advanced <laughs> nation. You know, to which... Uh, and also that they are just in the market for French philosophers. Right, but, you know, but, the, but it, you know, and that's... It's a comical concept mm-hmm. and at the same time, it, you know, it doesn't take you out of the book because right. it's who knows. Like what you can like... Because they felt the, the automatic... It's not the automatic jealousy, but the automatic reaction to tamp down what the jealousy I knew was coming. Right. Which right. It's, it's nice. It's an interesting way of, de- of de- uh, describing it. Yeah. He's self... Um, he's self-reflective. Right. Um, and... And it just goes on from there. Well, and these these are finely calibrated people. I yeah. mean, they're as calibrated as their as their machines. They know how to exist in a relationship. And as characters, they're incredibly self aware. Mm-hmm. Yes. And well, well, they're 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 narcissistic, mm-hmm. but but still, you know, like empathetic towards each other. You know, but and th- towards other people. Yeah, yeah, and uh, but and I I feel like whenever the technology comes up, I mean, and perhaps it's that you know the the book has such a cinematic feel by its very nature, but uh, it feels like whenever anyone's whipping out their technology, it turns into a commercial. And mm-hmm. and there's yes. just this fetishistic, they love their technology. And, and naming and, it. Yes. And, and all, using the proper numbers. Right. And doing that over and over and over again. It's not the voice recorder, it's the Nagra. Right. And it's like, you yeah. know. And especially with the cameras. I mean, the camera yeah. porn in this book. I, you know, I on, only have the vaguest grasp of what. Yeah. I have no idea what they were talking about. No, I, I yeah. enjoy when someone is an expert, which he clearly is. Right. And they can talk about something and it feels mystical in a way. Yeah. Like I have to take it, it the, the character's word that if they had the next model, they could do this thing that right. they couldn't do in the present right, right. scene. Well, right. and, and when they speak about how, you know, the lens that they're using, like, affects their gaze, mm-hmm. how they modify their filters mm-hmm. so they can see, remember things a certain way. Yeah, and there's this incredible scene where, is it, uh, I can't, well, fill the... Yuki? Or, what, is Yuki? Yuki? Which one? Where Naomi is, is looking at the film of, that Nathan has taken of a woman that he has slept with. Mm-hmm. And, oh, and she can tell. She yeah. can tell that it's, that great. it's like by, by, by his by. camera position, right. his, his yeah. uncertainty. Oh, oh on, on Chase. Yes. Yes. Yeah. She was filming Chase at her tea party. That was that was brilliantly party. described. Yes. Yes. She could read his uncertainty going forward, and then her by her openness, his the rel- the relaxation of his posture by the picture that he'd taken and yeah and well, she could tell his relationship with her yeah, yeah. and yeah, what cool. uh, you know in a camera giving the most uh, you know objective possible view of all the different ways to kind of communicate our perception of something it's um he can she can tell that he's you know in his you know in some sense falling in love with her mm-hmm. because Just, it's not objective at all yes mm-hmm. yeah like the choices that we make about how things are framed and what we zero in on affect our perception and our personalities and kind of define us. And, uh, and yeah, and the way that all the characters are, you know, the, like the older, the, uh, the, I mean, we have just this assemblage of mad scientists. I mean, it seems like with every chapter we're being led into a different dubious clinic Mm -hmm. and, um, where dubious disciplines are being practiced, but that all the, uh, the old men are, are, you know, they, they want to know more about photography. (laughs) <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> or you know, they or they want to uh, yes plug. Yeah, they all they all talk about uh, the technology in some way, right? And whether they know about it or they're curious about it. Yeah, yeah. I I, I find it interesting. Um, a lot of technology in the modern novel is often a problem, and it's been talked about a lot. How how you know it's something which is basically Dickensian. This mm-hmm. form h- how you have a cell phone and how you have right. Skype. Uh, and Cronenberg's really gone for it, and and often often the um, often it can feel superficial, but not here. I think right. he really he really understands these technologies. He understands he didn't just go on Skype to see what it felt like. Right. He, he knows he yeah. knows what what it feels like to. 
to hear the Skype phone ringing and right. to need to answer. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. <laughs> and that's, you know, and feeling like the author is a man of the world and he's steeped in this culture that he's describing. 